I will call this meeting of the Finance and Labor Relations Committee to order. Uh, item two, discourse or pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. Seeing none, I'll move on to item three. Uh, remarks from the Chief Administrative Officer. Please, Joan. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gaffney. So to begin uh, this evening's discussion, I just wanted to thank Mayor Matheson, Councillor Gaffney, and members of Council for your support and direction this year. As you know, it has been another challenging year for the city during the continued uh, pandemic and the declared emergency. CLT looks forward to supporting Council during your deliberations on the 2022 budget. And, um, and so next slide, please. So when looking back over the past 18 months since the emergency was declared in Stratford, many decisions have been made in response to the pandemic and the city's uh, implementation of the public health guidelines as they relate to our municipal services. I note that 2022 is a municipal election year as well as a possible provincial election year. We need to look ahead and make strategic decisions, not just for the short term, but for the long term positioning of this city. I want to say a special thank you to the corporate leadership team. Again, it has been another challenging year for this group, and there are new faces at the table who have stepped in and are contributing to the ongoing work of serving this community. Next slide, please. So just to recap, uh, so we are in stage three of the province's roadmap to reopening. And as you will note in September, the capacity limits were increased for specified indoor and outdoor facilities and proof of vaccination requirements and monitoring are also required. Financial controls continue to be in place to offset the revenue and expenditure pressures that we face. And I note that this is the second year of reduced municipal revenues and uh, the uh, monitoring of pandemic expenses. And that we are still not out of the pandemic and that we are having to consider next waves and into 2022. Next slide, please. Again, just to highlight, uh, we have continued uh, to maintain essential services in a declared emergency. As residents in Stratford and area have experienced, the Rotary Complex was the location of mass vaccination clinics. Municipalities throughout Perth County, including Stratford, hired staff to assist with the day-to-day -day management of these clinics, and city staff continue to be acti actively involved in the planning of future clinics. City staff have been collaborating with emergency and social service agencies to provide outreach and support to vulnerable persons in Stratford, St. Mary's, and throughout the County of Perth. But I do highlight that there were some positives. Daycare services returned to regular service with capacity limits in place. There were recreational programs and facilities available to the public this summer. All three routes of our community transportation pilot project are operating in 2021, again, with um, specific uh, capacity limits in place. The city has a diversity, equity, and inclusiveness plan consultant uh, in place, and we will be uh, reporting out on that work in the new year. The city is a partner with St. Mary's, Perth South, West Perth, Perth East, and North Perth, and have adopted a community safety and well being plan with specific implementation plans for each partner. As Council will recall, the plan identifies where there are gaps in our respective communities and sets out the framework to address these gaps with community partners. And as we are experiencing that community safety and well being plan is going to be of great assistance to us as the pandemic continues. The city continues to provide municipal services such as public and mobility transit safe drinking water, parks and open spaces, recreational facilities and activities, emergency services, waste collection and recycling services, and supports to a wide range of community agencies. This could not be done without the strong partnerships of our of, um, agencies, such as the Stratford Public Library, Invest Stratford, Destination Stratford, Chamber of Commerce, and the BIA. 
And I would like to thank these staff and all city staff for the incredible job you are doing during very challenging times. Next slide, please. But now to get to the 2022 budget. In looking ahead to this budget, there are a number of factors to be taken into consideration and of course, decisions having to be made. The focus will be on sustainability needs, the infrastructure investment, reserve funds, debt management, revenue sources, and identified operating costs. And the acting director of corporate services will discuss these factors in greater detail shortly. And so I won't go into a lot of detail here. Another item that I want to again raise with Council is that there are a number of large projects being discussed and Council direction will be needed as not everything is possible. There are difficult decisions that are needed to prevent further erosion of existing reserves. Next slide, please. So again, Council will be familiar with the strategic priorities um, that are guiding and focusing our decision making. Next slide, please. For the budget considerations, and as CLT considers and prepares the, their draft budgets, there are themes that emerge in trying to develop a sustainable budget, uh, continue to respond to the pandemic, and provide the essential services. With respect to asset management, Council is asked to consider the amount of aging infrastructure, service levels which can be influenced by financial constraints, acceptable level of infrastructure deficit, and what are adequate reserves. Most municipalities have an asset management backlog and meeting future asset management needs is going to be expensive. Related to the asset management backlog is consideration of the current staffing capacity needed to reduce that backlog. Next slide, please. You will also hear from the acting director uh, tonight about a longer term focus for budgeting and how decisions made now by this council have an impact on future budgets. There is a need to increase revenue through the attraction of commercial and industrial development and retention of existing businesses. And this is important in order to broaden the property tax base. And this will assist, this is just one strategy in funding reserves to address that asset backlog. Next slide, please. Each year, municipalities are challenged to meet growing community needs and requests for services while planning for the future and delivering services today. As you know, there are many mandated or legislative services that municipalities must operate um, and maintain or replace. As you know, infrastructure is nearing the end of its life cycle in many areas and securing funding to replace this is harder to obtain. Previous grants from upper levels of government are not necessarily available. This is leading to more borrowing, which must be repaid through the tax levy. As CAO, I request that Council consider our fiscal reality of needing restraint with strategic decision making related to the many competing priorities as you go through the department budgets and the list of referrals to budget. And a, list of, a copy of that list of referrals has been included with your agenda package. Next slide, please. At the July 26th Council meeting, these recommendations um, from Finance and Labor Relations Committee were adopted by Council. And following the presentation by the Acting Director tonight, CLT is looking to committee for direction with respect to this uh, referral list in particular. So any service level changes that Council uh, would like to consider or additional information so that we can finalize the draft budgets prior to presentation. And uh, we would request that that direction be given through a, a vote uh, tonight um, so that we have clear direction. Next slide, please. So in closing, um, we uh, appreciate your time and attention. We are looking for council input and we understand that the tough decisions that you have to make how much um, it is of a challenge to maintain the service levels that we currently have and how to balance the multiple interests from the community and the mandated programs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is my presentation um, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that Council may have at this time. 
anybody have any questions or wish to uh, further discuss anything mentioned during uh, Ms. Thompson's presentation? Okay, then uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Thompson. Uh, we'll move on to item four. Our remarks from the Acting Director of Corporate Services. Uh, if uh, you're ready, Carmen, uh, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, the screen sharing option, is that, am I doing that? Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, I guess we can start off by just sort of, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you tonight. Um, you're getting a very fresh set of eyes on the financial position for the city of Stratford, uh, been here a month now. And so I guess the purpose, you know, of my presentation is to talk about some of our current pressures and the priorities and to talk about the impacts uh, to the operating capital budgets, uh, particularly from those items that uh, the CAO had mentioned um, that have been referred to the budget discussions. So the slides that, that have been prepared today are intended for reference and for preliminary discussions. Um, any figures that are in here are really very preliminary. So, um, you know, if you have any specific questions about them, I'm happy to address them at a, at, like afterwards. Uh, next slide. So really a few of the financial highlights we're looking at, um, you know, um, is, is just to sort of talk about the, where we're at year to date. Um, some of our outstanding capital projects, uh, current debt, reserves and reserve funds, asset management, and some of the uh, uh, pressures that we're facing with this year's budget, which many of them will be familiar to you, but just to kind of wrap them all up with a pretty little bow. Next slide. Um, so really, this is just a snapshot here. So our current operating bank balance uh, as of September 24th was 23 million and change. Our accounts receivable and accounts payable, they, they clear very regularly. So they're not uh, uh, outstanding for any great periods of time, but they're comparable to prior years, sitting around the three and $4 million mark. Um, and outstanding taxes, which is uh, kind of a popular discussion with many councils, but uh, really we're sitting at with a very low arrears outstanding of about 1.3 million. Um, this is very actively managed. In fact, it's one of the better uh, tax arrears balances I've seen in many municipalities. So it's considered to be a very low level compared to uh, what the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing deems to be acceptable. So that's a, that's a good news uh, feature. Next slide. Um, Festival Hydro, as many of you will know, uh, had ceased issuing dividends um, through COVID. Um, they've since resumed again. Um, and through recent discussions that we've uh, had with them, these payments are expected to be fully caught up uh, before year end. Um, and just to, again, I'm kind of throwing random information in here, but basically the 2021 net budget uh, for, for this year was 63.4 million. Uh, compared to 62 million the year before. That's the net budget. So that's basically the amount funded by taxation only. Our total budget is closer to $121 million in, in terms of total expenses. Uh, the difference between 121 and the 63 million is uh, revenues raised from other sources, which I'll talk about a little bit in a bit. And next slide. Um, so before I get into the revenue uh, specifics, um, basically just preface it a little bit with um, that there's annual journal entries that still need to be recorded. Uh, we do a lot of our entries at year end, so some of these figures are very preliminary. Um, similarly to 2020, uh, the parking, recreation, and transit revenues are, are significantly impacted due to COVID and due to the operations. We hope that that will um, st start to get back up to normal towards uh, the end of this year and into 2022, but uh, there is probably going to be a lag for those revenues to be coming back to pre-COVID levels. Um, parking revenues, like, like again, we're forecasted to be a million dollars uh, right now under budget. Um, that includes a transfer of uh, $917,000 to the reserve fund. Um, parking reserve fund right now is at 3.2 million. Uh, recreation re revenues are also forecasted to be under budget by 600,000, again, a function of our, our reduced uh, operating um, capabilities within our arenas. 
Um, and then some transit revenue losses that we've, we're seeing right now have been offset by the receipt of the safe restart funding. So that does soften it a little bit, but there's still some probably expected uh, year end um, uh, variances from budget uh, to occur. Uh, next slide. Again, this is just a snapshot as of August the 23rd. I realize it's a little dated, but it's just to give everyone an idea that, you know, we have uh, $59 million roughly in revenues that are not taxation, and we have $63 million in taxation revenues. So that's where sort of all of our, our dollars come from. And um, next slide. This is just a pictorial um, presentation of that. So we get a fair fair bit of our revenues through grant funding, operational grants specifically for um, some of our services like uh, social services and uh, our OMPF funding is included in there as well. And then uh, the water sewer uh, revenues come from user fees. So it's just, there's a kind of a bit of a mix there, but you can kind of get a sense for um, that. I'll, I will comment on the grant uh, columns there. So we're, we're trying to show budgeted versus uh, actual. I'm not too excited about the variance there because it's a primarily timing differences. These are just revenues that hadn't, haven't been received yet. So, uh, but everything else is tracking the way we kind of expected. So, and same with other municipalities, those are revenue transfers that come from uh, our partners for some of our services that aren't yet, uh, haven't yet been billed. Next slide. Um, so departments are continuing to try and reduce their operating expenses where they can to reflect some of these reduced revenues, similarly to what they had done in 2020. Um, some of these include conferences and training and other what we would call non-essential expenses that can be avoided as a result of reduced activity. Um, these efforts, along with the lower than expected salaries and wages due to vacancies, have offset some of our revenue losses. Um, social services uh, activity typically completes accounting at year end, so those those um, transactions have not yet been reflected in our in our revenue, as I mentioned. User pay divisions such as water, sanitary, and uh, waste and Britannia Street departments, um, they're separated a little bit from our levy-based services. So any surpluses or deficits in those divisions doesn't impact the levy or the surplus deficit. It's, it's um, managed through our transfers to and from reserve funds at the end of the year. So next slide. So this is a, a, just a presentation of the operational expenses by department. Um, again, it's really just intended for a bit of a snapshot in time. It doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't it doesn't uh, reflect where we're going to be at year end, but it gives everyone an idea of where where our budgeted expenditures really are and where their year to date is sitting. Um, the budgeted expenses do include the transfers uh, uh, to reserves, so um, that's information that. You know, it, it becomes part of our whole capital funding process. Next slide. Um, this is again a little bit of a snapshot about our user pay department. So um, there's we've got budget of the budget versus the actual. So these are budgeted expenses and revenues. So they'll net out to zero for all of these services. So there won't be a levy impact. So the year the actual year to date is really just not reflecting all of the revenues or all of the expenses. So um, it can be a little bit confusing presenting it this way, but um, you know we'll have better information uh, for for committee and council when we get to our quarterly variance report as well. Next slide. Uh, so the 2021 capital projects uh, totaled about 79.6 million. Um, this included some additional um, adjustments through the year. I think there was a fire fire truck purchased in there, and um, maybe some other smaller items. Uh, we are expecting to carry forward some projects into 2022 of about uh, 56 million. Part of that is because of, um, of the, the uh, impact of COVID and not being able to get our, our uh, projects underway. Uh, but a good chunk of that also relates to the project for the renewable natural gas project of 22 million. Um, that was not not be not initiated nor nor funded through the year. So um, that comes up again in our conversations a little bit later on. But um, and so from the 2021 capital forecast, there's a, an additional 20 20 million dollars in capital works anticipated for 2022. But as as uh, the CEO had mentioned, these proposed budgets are still very much in draft uh, preparation. So. Um, it's one of these, one of the things that our consideration for our capital projects is to, is that we should be looking to 
um, carry these forward or reinstate them for safety reasons. Um, some capital projects just can't be done due to staffing and workload and are deferred as well. So it just there's there's multiple reasons about why we're we, we've got such a, a difference between um, projects that were approved and projects that will be completed for the year. Next slide. Long-term debt is uh, something I just wanted to touch on briefly because I know that uh, through this year, through 2021, Council had uh, approved uh, obtaining long-term debt for a couple of projects, primarily the uh, Queen Street uh, project. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on this because the uh, amount of borrowing that the municipality can actually obtain is limited through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And basically the annual debt repayment limit or the ARL is, is, a, is a calculation that's approximately 25% of our net revenues. So really it's, it's, that's how they determine what our limit is. So in 2020, based on our 2019 financial information return, they determined that our annual amounts that we are annual maximums is 15 million per year. So that's that's 15 million of debt repayment per year. We had a total amount of outstanding debt at year at the at December 2020 of 56 million and our total payments were 6.3. So the point of this is to sort of say that you know we're sitting at 6.3 of annual payments but we have a maximum of 15 million allowed by the ministry. Um, in 2021, as I mentioned earlier, the 33 million adds about another 2 million to that 6.3 million. So we're sitting at about 8.3 million out of the 15 million. So that that all that says is that we're about halfway to the maximum under which the province would allow us to be indebted. So just want to put that out there as information only. It really for, for sort of just for illustrative purposes, if we were to cap out and max out all of our borrowing, that would probably look like close to 200 million, depending on how long we structured those payments. But, um, you know, it's, we're just, I just want to make council aware that, you know, we are, we are approaching about the halfway mark about what's uh, an acceptable level from the ministry's perspective. I don't know a whole lot of municipalities that are interested in coming close to that limit because it really has a significant impact on the taxpayer and on the levy um, to, to structure those repayments. So um, it's just a, just a bit of information as we move forward into, into the budget discussions. Next slide. So this is just a, uh, another pictorial of our current outstanding uh, debt as a total. It's really only based on approved um, debenture financing that we have. So as we repay it, it decreases. It's a fairly standard chart. It does not include um, uh, any debt debt. Uh, financed projects that are not yet approved. So there are a number of them in the pipeline, as I'm sure you are all aware. So uh, we'll get, have to get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, next slide. Again, this is the debt servicing. So this refers back to our, our annual repayment amounts. So it looks like, you know, by about 2025, we're reaching a, a, a repayment of about 10 million in the year and our maximum based on the ministry is about 17 million so it just kind of gives you a sense of where we're at compared to what where, where we're where our current debt is at versus where our maximums can possibly be okay next slide so we can't really have a, a pre-budget discussion without talking about reserves and reserve funds because these these form part of our or most of our um, funding source for our capital projects um, just want to make the distinction between reserve funds and reserves you may be aware or may not but uh, reserve funds are specifically committed for a particular purpose through legislation um, these include things like dcs or gas tax where the municipality cannot choose to spend them on something other than what those uh, legislative restrictions are um, and then reserves are, are made they're distinguished from reserve funds in the sense that they also are committed for specific purposes, but they really represent just an allocation of previous surpluses. So, you know, we, we would say that these would be funded through our general bank account, whereas reserve funds are required to have segregated funds um, and a separate bank account, which we do have for the city. So um, again, both represent liabilities to the corporation. So again, I, I sort of like to uh, hit this point on the head because um, even though, um, they're somewhat discretionary in their purpose. They are um, committed funds or committed for purpose um, by council. So 
that's why they appear in often in our reports as a negative or a, would have a bracket around them because they're considered to be a liability. Most of the capital reserve funds come up as a result of transfers from the levy or user fees um, with the intention of funding current or future year projects. Um, but you know, we, we kind of come up with a bit of a projected balances based on uh, what we expect to have happen in the year. Um, as we work to, um, and so I've also, as part of this presentation or part of the agenda, included the reserve and reserve fund policy just for council's reference so that they can see you know, why we have set up the reserves the way that we have, what the purposes are, and some of the minimums and maximums that were set in place by policy. So um, it's something that the reserve fund policy is actually a, a quite a good one compared to some others that I've seen in the sense that it's pretty explicit and it's, it's very um, transparent as far as what those funds are for. Uh, but it will require some revisiting as we look to integrate our asset management plan process uh, because you know, our asset management policy and our asset management program does have um, a dependency on those reserve and reserve funds. So we may need to revisit some of those limits and some of those um, suggested balances that we're retaining. Um, next slide. So this is again, a, a bit of a snapshot, a lot of numbers here. Bottom line is just to, to kind of give everyone an idea that, you know, we start with our opening balance in 2021 from our audited 2020 numbers. Uh, we transfer in money from our from our tax levy, and we transfer out money for our for our projects that we've got in place. So, the bottom line for this one is that for a discretionary type of reserves, where we have some ability to maneuver um, balances between accounts, if we were so inclined, or borrow from other reserves, we've got thirty seven million dollar of an opening balance and a twenty five million roughly closing balance. So that just sort of says that you know in twenty twenty one we were using more of our reserves, reserve funds than we were um, transferring in. Not, not the end of the world, this number will fluctuate over time and through the years, but you don't wanna see that as an ongoing trend over you know, multiple years. Um, we did notice an error just actually as I was preparing for this meeting um, in the wastewater um, line item. So um, I just wanna point that out. I, I don't have the exact figures, but there is, it was a bit of a misprint in the, uh, in the, balance, in the transfers out balances. So um, if anybody spots that, I, I am aware. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So in addition to those discretionary reserve funds, we also have the reserve funds that are segregated by development charges. So this is just a bit of a summary of those development charge reserve balances. Um, again, we don't have the budgeted transfers in because we typically don't know what that looks like. So that's why that column is blank, but we are expecting to spend some of the development charges. So that's the transfer out column. Again, there's nothing, nothing too spectacular about this information. It's just a bit of a snapshot. Uh, next slide. So in addition to the discretionary and the de uh, development charges, we also have what we call the obligatory reserve fund. So those are the ones that are really um, very restricted in terms of what, what we can do with the funds. Um, gas tax is kind of the most popular one to, to talk about. And so um, those obligatory reserve funds are also, um, we're utilizing more than what's going into them in, in any given, in this given year. So um, it's not a trend that we'd like to see, um, you know, going on every year, but it does happen periodically just from, um, you know, so operations cycles. Um, so one of the things that, uh, you know, I, one of the things I looked at when I first arrived was the, when, when we take a, an aggregate look at the, all of the reserve um, fund balances, um, is how much do we have in the bank versus how much do we have committed to all of these types of categories. So, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's close. <laughs> we're, we're looking at um, about, uh, say like $68 million in, in obligatory or in, in obliged funds or committed funds, but only about $42 million in cash to support that. The bank balance is one of those balances. We also have investments and we also have our general operating account, which kind of forms all of the whole uh, summary for that. Next slide. So uh, included in my comment just now is this uh, projected reserve. So again, these are reserves where we, we, we as, a, as a city have, have determined that we would like to have certain monies uh, aside for certain things. Um, and so we've set up these types of uh, reserves. These are a lot more discretionary uh, in the sense that we could 
theoretically redistribute these, um, not, a, not without revising our policy, obviously, but um, you know, it's something that if, if we felt that there was too much in, in certain reserves or there was a better use for those reserves, we could rearrange them a little bit. Um, but yeah, so my, my point was, is that, you know, in, in total, um, you know, we've got all of these internal liabilities of about 68 million, but we really don't have a full, fully, full cash support for those. I'm not, it's not a huge difference, 68 million versus 42 million, it seems like a lot, but there are, there are some factors that will influence this. One of those is uh, any debenture funding that we are, we are going to get, but we don't have yet. So the 33 million, for example, or for uh, previously uh, pro previous projects that we have funded through our regular bank account, but that we are expecting to receive funds back, say, for example, from development charges over a period of time or from um, like any any future loans or debentures. So that number, like the, the difference between uh, 68 and 42, um, it's not quite as big as that, but it is just something that to, to keep an eye on as, as, the, as the treasurer that we're, you know, making sure that we are fully funded and that we're, we've got the amount of resources we need to, to do all of our internal, pay all of our internal, internal and external debt. Uh, next slide. Asset management. So this is one of my favorite things. So I'll maybe talk about this for a couple of minutes, but basically we are facing um, like every municipality in Ontario, significant asset management pressures. So one of the, the challenges is, is that in, in the past or in like uh, a practice, practice in the past, we've presented council with a 10 year capital plan uh, with the recommended projects and the um, you know, expected um, spending that's required over the next 10 years. That said, um, you know, those, those figures are adjusted based on staff's recommendations and they're not necessarily comprehensive or including all of our assets required to deliver our services. So one of the one of the um, things that we're looking to do when we have our uh, asset management coordinator beginning is once we get them oriented and sort of into the role is looking at providing some additional training for staff and council around what asset management really means to the city and really looking at ensuring that our asset registry and our asset listings are up to date and accurate and that our 10 year capital forecast does include all of the assets required to provide our current services. So sometimes what, you know, we, we will put things, uh, you know, uh, to the back burner, but, you know, if we've got a policy that stipulates that assets have a useful life of, you know, 10 years, then we should be looking to fund the replacement of those assets at the end of the 10 year mark. So we do, we do a reasonable job of, of, of funding our, our current priorities, but not necessarily having that be complete. So um, and one of the one of the biggest things that that goes along with funding all of those assets is really taking a, a good look at what our service level looks like, not just in terms of what our what services, um, what the level of service to the public looks like, but whether those services that we provide are what we should be in the business of providing. So it's those those conversations that come up, you know, later on in our asset management discussions. So next slide. So we'll be looking at building up our longer term forecasts for a 20, 20 plus year plan, not necessarily something that council will get a whole lot you know, of involvement in because that's a really long time frame. but it does allow us to be a little bit more comprehensive in our, in our approach to this and, and you know, not, not get caught up in shifting or deferring projects um, just for the sake of, of managing a current year budget. So we can kind of see, see what those look like over a longer period of time. It, gives, it lets us look at um, the future with a little bit more stability and sustainability so we can try to manage those ahead of time rather than having emergencies happen at the last minute. And under provincial regulations, our levels of service and financial strategies must be integrated with the city's budgeting process by 2024. This is a legislated requirement under the uh, asset management regulations and our eligibility for future capital funding is dependent upon this. So this is not a, uh, the new girl's new idea here. This is a thing that's coming along, you know, through the province for every municipality. It's going to be a challenge for sure for us and for everybody else, but it's just to make sure that we are uh, that our funding models are are based on sustainability and not just moving the shells around to to prioritize our our current need. Okay. 
Next slide. So the 2022 and beyond, I guess we've had quite a few pressures as um, the CAO has alluded to with respect to COVID. Um, we did receive in 20 and 2020 and 2021 uh, some funding uh, to offset some of the COVID related expenses. That's, that's helped a fair bit. Um, and additional funding is not anticipated at this time, but as uh, the CAO had alluded to as well, the revenues are still expected to be impacted and remain lower than pre-COVID levels for some services. Um, another pressure that we we're constantly sort of battling with is the, is the cost to proceed with uh, projects and operational services continue to escalate at rates faster than inflation for some things. A good example of this is uh, construction costs. So sometimes construction uh, CPI indexes, indices are greater than the, you know, the consumer price indexes. So it's, it's just one of those things that, you know, just to bear in mind and just realize that that is a, a real pressure. A couple of examples we can give you uh, based on what we see today, um, talking about our 2022 insurance renewal. You guys might still be stinging from the 2021 insurance renewal. It was quite a significant impact at 30% increase. That was very, very commonly felt across the, the province. Uh, we're not expecting a level of increase like that, but we are expecting it to be around 10%. Um, that's a reflection of the fact that we've had fairly a fair, a fair few number of claims and not uh, a huge amount of activity on our end. So we're able to capture some, um, let's say, uh, not reduced, uh, reduced increases as opposed to savings, but, um, and then go also another factor that we have to look at uh, is with uh, going into our insurance renewal. It's, it's been uh, communicated to us by our insurer that we aren't able to obtain environmental liability insurance coverage for some of our under, for all of our underground tanks that are over 25 years old. So we have, we have a few of these and we've gotten a preliminary cost replacement cost estimates that range anywhere from 440 to 500,000. So these are not things that were necessarily on our radar because they, the tanks are meeting the safety standards that are required, but the insurers are backing away from some of this type of risk management. And so they're, they're basically deciding that they don't want to be in this market for that particular type of, of um, managing of that particular type of risk. So. Um, just a bit of a heads up, a uh, spoiler alert, if you will. Um, the range in the pricing has to do with whether or not the tanks are uh, above ground or below ground. And the below, below ground tanks do take a good lead time of about a year to, to get them designed, inspect, and, and put in. So that's something that, you know, that the departments are, are aware of and are, will be working towards going into 2022. Based on the fact that we have, we're, we're developing a bit of a plan to deal with this, I am hoping that our insurer will be able to get us an extension for coverage. But we also have, um, you know, in, that goes along with this is a, a large deductible relating to these types of claims. So even if we do have insurance, we have a large deductible if there is such a claim uh, made for that purpose. So just something to think about and something to, to bear in mind that staff are looking to manage. Next slide. So um, this is a duplication of a slide. So I'm actually going to see if we can skip this one because I, I touch on it a bit later. So. Um, so with the previous information considered and wrapping it all up a little bit, um, we're trying to provide council with a financially responsible budget without affecting or reducing service levels. So this includes, this, this approach includes building up some reserves to reduce infrastructure pressures later, um, using debt as an appropriate funding tool, um, considering all of our available revenue tools, which includes growth funding growth or using development charges where appropriate, um, and whether additional services should be moving closer to fully user pay funded. This conversation actually came up, uh, it comes up uh, regularly in the city where I live in Owen Sound. And uh, one of the things that they like to, to toss around is the concept of, you know, waste management services being fully user pay. So, um, you know, the garbage bag tags fully funding the, uh, the uh, curbside collection of services. So, that's something that it doesn't usually, um, it's not usually very palatable for people, but um, it's something that as, as staff, we have to consider which services should be um, approaching fully user pay and which ones should be, you know, spread across the levy as a whole. So just a bit of conversation around that. Um, and then we're looking at also the integration of the asset management plan and using the asset management plan to um, establish our rehabilitation plan. So what that means is more uh, like more of a focus on 
planning our like our events that occur throughout the life of an asset. So if it's a roof replacement or it's a an engine overhaul or something significant that's required throughout the life of a particular asset that we're planning for those two and they're not surprises in a given um, operating year. And we're looking at growth related uh, development and how it gets funded both at the outset and ongoing. So again, this is something where we, you know, we sometimes will say things like, well, that's, that's a growth project and, and that should be paid for by development charges, but we may or may not have collected enough development charges at the outset of the project to fully fund it. So we have to find some interim financing or some bridging to deal with uh, how we, how we uh, pay for it before um, the users get billed for it. So. Um, next slide. So we talk a little bit about the two to 3% tax uh, increase as the direction of from council and it does reflect general inflationary impacts but it doesn't really deal with any of those uh, things I mentioned that sometimes increase beyond the two to 3%. Um, it doesn't look at in, uh, infrastructure projects that have been deferred or those that have been identified as unfunded. So it's not considering things like uh, projects, and I'm just throwing out a couple that I've heard since I started here, such as the community hub, the industrial land inventory, or um, the RNG project. So these, all of these projects require significant resources that have not yet been determined or at least included in our financial plan long term. So um, capital projects uh, and their funding sources that have been previously approved will carry forward into the 2022 capital forecast and through the budget process. It's designed to ensure that previously committed reserves are not erroneously reallocated, but also it shows um, it shows council and it, and it helps staff track the operational workload ahead. So it just, um, it just kind of keeps everything in a big picture. So next slide. So this is just a bit of a, a, a snapshot of what some of the considerations are when, when we're determining the capital priorities. So we're looking at specific sector needs um, and looking at uh, supporting documents that may have uh, so may, may bring that forward. So such as, you know, need studies or master plans, that sort of thing. Um, we're also trying to evaluate individual project merits and looking at how that timing fits in in the 10 year forecast. We look at health and safety, we look at uh, operational and capacity constraints. So now that we've got, a, I'll say a bit of a backlog in terms of the 2021 activities that won't be completed, combining those with the 2022 proposed works, is that is that a feasible uh, operational workload? So we have to assess that as well. Uh, we need to assess our funding sources and we also need to look at what is considered to be growth versus rehabilitation and replacement of our, in our current assets and our core infrastructure. I touched on this earlier, but I just want to point out again, like, you know, we talk a lot about our, our budget and we talk a lot about our $63 million that we raised from the taxpayer, but I just, I want to sort of bring to the attention that that's not, that's not the full picture. That's the net picture. Um, if our total expenses are 121 million, then that means that we funded 58 million from other sources, which include user fees, grants, and other reserves. Um, to come to a net number for the taxpayer. So that's just a, a bit of a, a nuance and a language um, translation thing. So um, next slide. So during 2022, we're working towards future budget presentations to be multi-year, um, operating to be uh, multi-year for three to five years. Um, and just to kind of, the, the purpose of this is not so that uh, approval is being sought for subsequent years. It's more to sort of demonstrate the impacts of decisions made. So for example, if a you know, $33 million debenture is approved in a year one, what does that look like and how does that impact year two, three, and four? So it just kind of gives, um, and, and you know, the other thing is if we purchase a new tracker, we you know, obtain a new loan, what do, what do those future uh, payments, uh, how do they impact our current levy? So. Um, it's just to give a better idea as we go through this process and multi year budgeting is really a fairly new thing for municipalities overall, but it's also just it's really more for an illustration tool than anything else. Um, it's not it's not committing uh, future years or committing council for future years. There's still a whole budget process that we have to go through every year, and we want to go through every year to reassess uh, what our what our current services are. But it gives a, a better longer term focus. So that in a conjunction with the 10 year capital plans, possibly 20 year capital plans, will be sort of the focus for the future year budgets. Next slide. 
So really that was just to sort of give you a, a bit of a, an idea of where things are at. Um, we, we are proceeding with the uh, previous direction provided uh, with two to 3%, uh, but we're looking for uh, members of committee and council to provide us with some further input on some of the items previously referred to uh, to the budget um, and any new and emerging priorities and initiatives that we may not be aware of yet or that, we're, that council would like to make sure are included in our process for 2022. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I am very happy to take any questions or comments. Um, yeah. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, Council Corford? Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, on our reserves, and you went over the reserves, Carmen, was there any reserves that were overfunded or any individual reserves that were drastically underfunded? I, I don't know if you can answer that right now, but obviously you've spent some time on reserves. That's something we haven't spent a lot of time on. So I, I'm interested in an answer either now or in the future. I, I can answer it now, actually. So as far as um, being overfunded, I would say that I can make a general statement to say that there, if there's anything that's overfunded, it's not by a very large amount. Um, if there's some, there, there's some, most, I think all of the reserves, when I first checked them were within the ranges established by the policy. So again, that's something I do want to revisit again when we start talking about our asset management plan, but at the current policy, they're, they're within the range. Um, whether they're underfunded or not, again, comes back to where do, we, where do we need to be based on our asset requirements over the next five to 10 years? It'll be easier for me to answer that question once we get right into more into the asset management and the integration of that, of that asset management policy and mass asset management plan um, going into the next year. Unfortunately, it's not an easy question to just answer on a, like as a snapshot type of question, but it's a, great, it's a great one and it is something that I'd like to keep at the forefront of our discussions. Councilor Clifford, to all of us. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I don't know. I had to go up because I had a phone call and I apologize. But have we talked about the LPAT, it, like the, the consequences on depending on what we have to pay for 135? And I know that decision is, is coming. And has that been looked at? Because that could be. And the other thing, just while I'm thinking about it, we, we did pay a lot. The, 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 like the Queen, the Queen Street project was a lot higher than we projected. So we've got to account for that in 2022 also, like the capital and the interest on that. Um, through the chair. So the I'll talk about the Queen Street project and I may have to defer to someone else on the uh, LPAT status because I'm not sure about that one. But for the Queen Street project, definitely as part of the presentation that you will see when we get to our draft budgets, the, the repayment of that 33 million will be included in our operating uh, budgets for the particular department. So it'll be it'll be very much reflected as would any um, any of our current debt is already reflected in our budget so uh, for repayment. So it may be slightly or maybe higher than what was originally planned, but when we talk about those payments being over a 10 or a 20 year time frame, it's probably not that significant on the, on the operating uh, budget for repayment, but I, I'll speak to that a little more carefully when we get to the draft budgets. Thank you. Councillor Vasilakos, did I see your hand up earlier? So I had so I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the reserve balances um, and asset management because I'm I'm really very interested in the overlaying of those two to make sure that we um, and one of the things I'm assuming at some point we'll have a look at like in that reserve policy we have a minimum and an optimal and it would be I know COVID has thrown everything into a bit of disarray and so it, that data is probably not as useful but over time sort of understanding how often we meet that minimum, how often we get close to that optimum. And as we move forward, having that asset management plan um, informing this reserve policy on whether that optimal actually really is the optimal. And so I'm, I'm assuming that what we're talking about when we're talking about looking at asset management and budgeting and reserve balances is, is making sure that those minimums and optimums are, are correct. Is that correct? I would say yes, generally speaking, that's the goal. Um, again, because our, our um, asset management coordinator positions not yet even filled, you know, we're, we're, it's gonna be something that drags into or carries on into 2022 and beyond. It probably isn't something that I can give council a, a good comfort level going into the 2022 budget year 
um, as far as whether we're fully funded or whether those balances are fully optimal or not. But when we start to talk about um, uh, and start to integrate, like I said, that that you know our asset registry of what assets we own, what are what is required to fully required to deliver every level of service that we have for every department, then we'll have a better idea of what whether or not those reserves are are sufficient. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you know, there's not a province in Ontario that has sufficient level of reserves for their asset management plan. But that's where the province is pushing back to municipalities to say what what service levels and what lines of business are you really in, and which ones do you really need to fund from from your um, from your taxpayer and from your contributions um, to the reserve. So it, it is a bit of a, a, a like a longer term focus than what our 2022 budget process will actually be. But hopefully we'll get you there and we'll be able to answer those questions a little more th more thoroughly during the next year. And so I just had a couple, like a couple more. Um, one of the, the things is that when we talk about debt servicing is um, sort of understanding the proposed projects that have a revenue piece to it that may offset that debt um, servicing and which ones do not, because that, that even though we have a ceiling of what we're allowed to, how much debt we're allowed to service in any given year, our capacity to do so through revenue versus the levy and the net is I think a really important consideration when we, a project can be a have higher ticket item, but it could also have a much higher revenue stream that actually exceeds. Like the Britannia I think is a really good example where it had a fairly large price tag and fairly large um, debenture. But on the flip side of that is that if you look at the reserve on it now, it's always, we're all, always transferring money into reserve on that project. And it didn't actually come out of the, the levy, the, the funding for. So I think that's a really important differentiation as we try to understand which capital projects to do and which ones we don't. Um, and sometimes it's also Queen Street had a large debenture, but it's a really necessary project. So it almost didn't matter where the money was coming from. So okay. that conversation I'm, I'm hoping we can get to when we get to each individual project. That was more a comment than a question. And my, my final thing is, is blue bin and producer pay. I think that's an interesting one in terms of what you, you just because you mentioned uh, waste and recovery. Um, I'm just wondering what the status of, do we know the status of that? As we ha and maybe not for this meeting, but as we start to talk about, um, you know, garbage tag rates and those kinds of things, do we know when that producer pay comes online and what that may may or may not do? And I see our director of infrastructure is up, so maybe he has a an answer to that. Yes, just to the chair, we will be bringing a report in the upcoming months just to update you where the uh, extended producer responsibility system sits and the impact it will have us in the uh, upcoming years. Thank you, uh, Councillor Inger. Thank you. So I have two questions, but before I do, um, I don't think Councillor Clifford's LPAC question regarding 135 got answered. I'm wondering if there's a staff member that could answer that before I ask my questions. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, as you know, we did have the five week expropriation uh, award. Uh, hearing earlier this uh, this year. Uh, no decision has been received from the LPAT uh, chair at this time. Um, we are anticipating that perhaps by the end of the year or into the new year. And um, again, until we know what that decision is and any possible appeals uh, to that decision, um, then Carmen and I will be sitting down and having a, a discussion and bringing some options forward to council at that time. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I guess my my first point is is rather a question or a comment, not so much a question, but in respect to what Councillor Vasilakos was saying about some of those capital projects that are larger larger ticket items, but also have a revenue generating line, I'm wondering um, if we could also have that for the operating because there are some positions or um, items within the operating budget that do have a revenue component to them. So that would be helpful when we're having those discussions as well. And I noted on, um, let's see here, I guess it was the last page of the referrals to the 22 
2022 budget. It was the one year contract position for the overnight parking enforcement officer that would have a revenue component to it. So it would be helpful just um, for deliberations to be able to discuss that. Um, and then my question is actually related to number 10 on that list. Uh, so number 10 on page two from July 12th, 2021, and that the development of a municipal partnership program be referred to the 2022 budget deliberations coming out of community services. Can you remind me what the background is for that um, program, please? Yeah, I, uh, through the chair, I think I can help. It is to develop a program that will allow the uh, city to market and advertise by uh, selling assets. And first we would inventory the assets and see what value is. And if I can use an example, we have done this in the past with the Rotary Complex where we have sold arena advertising to uh, both arenas. Those, uh, both those contracts have expired, but the program would identify not only the asset, but what the value is. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Seven. Thank you. I just was wondering the uh, the slide that showed the the uh, debt outstanding forecasted versus current. I'm just wondering if the forecasted items are ones that have been decided on, or are those items that are to be decided on? Um, through the chair, those are just the approved ones that to date. So again, there's there could be other impacts that affect that. It's just a snapshot in time as to where we sit now. Okay, thank you. So so that doesn't include things that you mentioned before that are on the horizon, like the RNG and things like that. Right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I have just one more comment, if I may, through the chair. Um, I couldn't have done this without the help of the senior team, especially, and all of the staff here. I'm pretty new to this role, so I wanted to just express my thanks for, to their contributions and my crash course in Stratford History 101 uh, that I've had over the last month. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councillor Vasilakos. Sorry, the screen thing again, so it takes me a second. Um, I had a question around the, the referrals to the um, 2022 budget. We had it that additional resources to implement and sustain the community safety and well-being plan <laughs> referred to the budget process and it has social services on there. Um, I'm wondering that plan also is linked to um, the Stratford Police Services. And so would there be a joint implementation plan that then would have to impact the police services or, or have they considered that within their budgeting as well um and then also have we heard it, if there's any provincial funding for this since it was a provincially mandated plan have they come up with any dollars for um this implementation Uh, through the chair, at this point, we are not seeing any grants that have come through. We we do keep an active uh, look for for uh, the ministries to provide the grants, so that that is not the case at this point. Uh, we are looking to have a budget uh, that is shared between the municipalities. So my other question with respect to do we see an impact of the community and safety well-being plan on the police services budget or and I don't know if uh, Councillor Bunting perhaps can you know speak to that since he's on the police services board in their budgeting process is and that included at all the chief is here too oh sorry yeah I can't because we only see little black boxes maybe one of you could answer that then thank you Yes, uh, through the chair, I can uh, I can uh, answer that, uh, Councillor. Um, we the uh, police service board and the police service are currently in deliberations on their uh, budget for the upcoming year, and that is a, a budget item that we would consider including some money for the community safety and well-being plan implementation. But at this point, we haven't um, uh, solidified our budget. Uh, for the upcoming year. So those are still deliberations that we will have with the board. Thanks, Chief. 
uh, Councillor Henderson. I had a couple questions about the reserve fund, but for some reason, my uh, paperwork is disappearing because <laughs> I'm out of memory or something. But anyway, I, I know the one was on page 22 and it talked about that reserve was going to be, um, it sounded like it should have been done like in 2017, if I can remember from my memory when I was reading it. And I'm just wondering, are those types of reserves just held open in case something else needs to come along? And has that reserve actually finished the project? Like I'm assuming it has, because I think it had a deadline. So those types of reserves, do they automatically just disappear? Or do you actually have to come back to council and have it dissipated? Or how does that work? You know what I mean? There was another one too, but I, I couldn't get down my cheek today. It won't let me. Um, through the chair, I can answer that. So um, the reserve and reserve fund policy does require that any um, additions of new reserves or reserve funds or the dissolution of any previous would come through council. If there was a situation where it was internally allocated funds, for example, for a specific, I don't know, like a some kind of a, a, a project or a study or something like that, and it came in under budget or the project got completed without using all the funds, then those those monies could be reallocated elsewhere and, and the, that reserve collapsed. But um, I'm not really in a position at this point to comment on what the status of some of those are. But if you have a specific question, I didn't quite understand or hear which, which reserve you're referring to when you were trying to find that. It was on page 22 of the, of the um, finance report. Hey, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Henderson, uh, page 23, she's talking, I think Bonnie, you're talking about economic development. Yes, I am. Okay, okay. Utilizations of funds at the end of the agreement. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, like it looks like it would have been done like about three years ago. I'm just wondering. I know, um, I believe Michael went through all the reserve funds and he got rid of quite a few because it was a whole bunch and amalgamated a bunch together and got rid of the ones that had been done. Type of thing. That sounds like one that's been done and maybe just still sitting there. I'm not sure. Do you know? I don't know, no. And I just had one more comment. I really appreciate how you're presenting this budget because I think it's very helpful for people that are listening and you know, don't do the budget every year. And uh, I think you're giving very clear um, explanations about things and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the public does too, thanks. Thank you. And I do welcome any and all of you to contact me if you have specific questions at any time. That's part of my role here to be your advisor and provider of information. So don't don't go too long without asking questions for sure. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions? Uh, uh, Councilor Ritzma. Yes, thank you. Through you, the chair. Just going back to the um, uh, growth funding growth process. I just want to expand or, or delve into that a little bit more. Can you give me, give us an idea of where might this be utilized to a greater extent? Um, well, I guess as part of our long-term planning and our, our um, conversations as we set our development charges background studies that are currently underway, um, you know, we're trying to identify projects that are on the horizon where infrastructure is required, doesn't yet exist, but any future growth is going to impact that. It might be extending a road, it might be putting in water and sewer services, that sort of thing. So those are the types of, of projects that if identified, we can plan for. Um, but what I was referring to in, in the presentation was that, you know, sometimes what will happen is, you know, we have to lay that infrastructure or pay for that infrastructure before the development comes or before those uh, people pay the development charges that are to fund that. So there can sometimes be a timing difference or timing gap with respect to that. So um, each like, you know, and again, I will, we're, we're get we're in the throes of the development charges background study now, but that's the intent is to identify um, you know, future future projects that may occur as a result of growth and development. Did that help? Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Councillor Vasilakos. Um, and actually that just tweaked me as well as sort of the idea of what a growth strategy though is also um, how we leverage existing infrastructure to um, provide growth where we don't actually have to create new services and how that can have a, a, a really um, can have an immediate and positive impact on on that net levy in the absence of having to do some of that that um, construction or borrowing or expansion of infrastructure and how it, it's a, it's a, an efficient um, strategy for assessment growth and and I don't we we don't talk I don't know that we've ever had a really good conversation around that but examples how that can be different because sometimes you add that infrastructure but it's it's a loss leader or just net zero on growth whereas if you have growth in the absence of needing new infrastructure it's just positive without a without a a, um, a negative so through the background study with the development charges, I haven't been involved in it at this point to date here, but in my previous experience, you know, so we, we do sort of want to capture an element of, I'll call it wear and tear on our infrastructure related to the new people that are <laughs> utilizing the infrastructure. So there is a, there is an element or an, an opportunity to, to um, allocate some of our development charges to to uh, current projects. And again, it's just a matter of, of identifying what those would really look like because you can't really, like um, the legislation doesn't really allow for us to, uh, you know, blanketly say for every single, you know, road resurfacing, for example, there's an element of growth uh, uh, impact to it or an element of, sorry, an element of deterioration related to in, like uh, accelerated growth. but. Um, but certainly there are some main main ones that we can definitely include and that's that's part of the discussion as we, we build the background study. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, seeing none, we'll next move on to the question of looking at that list of council referrals for 2022 budget. Are there any ones that stand out to anyone that uh, we may be able to forego uh, to a future uh, uh, budget? Uh, Councillor Clifford. Yes, when I went over it, um, we, we do have a police department. We have the police chief here, but in my mind, to hire someone and to provide a car to give tickets for people that are parking overnight. I, I, I think that is something that with cooperation from the police, like the other thing, if you hire someone and they do a really good job, the same people aren't gonna keep parking overnight. So I, I, I just think that is something that we should be speaking to the police services board and, and the police department to take care of that for us. Because if we had the blitz every once in a while, it would basically stop it other than maybe people having parties at Christmas or whatever, but I, I think that's something I don't think we have to spend any money on, quite frankly. Councillor Ingram. Thank you, yes. So we talked about this at our last uh, infrastructure, transportation and safety subcommittee. Um, and it, the discussion sort of involved the police force, but that overnight parking is definitely not a priority for the police force, that they have um, much higher priority items to do than overnight parking. Um, and it was becoming an issue. We've heard um, from our snowplow operators that it's an issue through the winter. And so the reason that it was a one-year contract was because we thought there could be an education piece in conjunction with this specific hire. Um, and that as people start to get ticketed, with the education, then perhaps it would it would uh, at least curb it. It's not going to stop it, but it would at least curb it. And then we're not relying on the police force because of of the other items that they have to do. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Miss Thompson or uh, uh, Miss Defoe. Um, because these items generally came from subcommittee, do we want to have some sort of in, uh, motion made by the full committee we have before us tonight or 
how do we want to deal with these items as they come up? Uh, Ms. Thompson, I see your hand came up. Thank you, um, Chair Gaffney. Um, so with the list that's before you, um, we would ask for specific further direction. If there is um, one or two items on here um, that you would like count, uh, CLT to give serious consideration of including in the budget. I will say that there are what 16 items on that and not everything is doable in the 2022 budget. So unless specific direction is given on one or two here, the rest a CLT will attempt to incorporate, but um, to be realistic, not all of this can be done in the budget with a two to 3% tax levy and all of the other capital projects that need to be dealt with as well as the 2021 um, unfinished project list. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. So I guess I'm gonna, I'm going to look to Councillor Ingram because I see your hand up. Thank you. So I would like um, committee to give serious consideration to number eight, which is that council refer the asset management financial strategy to the 2022 budget deliberations. I think that's going to benefit us uh, moving forward in future years. So would you like to make a motion to that effect? I would please, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Ingram. Seconded by Councillor Vasilakos. Okay, any uh, questions or discussion on that? Councilor Clifford. Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's, it's on that, but it's on everything else. When we got that, those, um, all those projects we talked about, as far as the costing, I didn't, like, we have to have costing related to each one of them, and including what we're talking about right now, how much is it gonna cost? So it would be interesting to have that info, have that info before we decided exactly what we're going to do. Uh, Ms. Thompson? Yes. So again, if there are one or two items from the referral list that council would like further information on, tonight would be a good uh, time to let us know and then we can uh, do some more work on this, including uh, possible costing and bring those back to the, the budget deliberations. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Basilakos. Um, I had a, another item, but did we want to take a vote on the, the, the motion that's on the floor first before I go through? Yeah, yeah that's what I was, uh, but I think uh, Councillor Seven may have a question on it first. Thank you. Can I just clarify, are we moving, uh, I guess clarify with Councillor Ingram, are we moving that this be referred to the budget deliberation of this item and then we would have more information at that point? Uh, through the chair, it's my understanding that staff, senior staff are asking for a couple of the items from this list for us to um, place higher priority on over the other items so that they can bring back other information. Um, and I turn to our CAO just to clarify if I'm incorrect on that. Okay, great. It's That's my fine. understanding you are correct. Great, thank you. Thank you. If nobody else has any questions on that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. Carried. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything? Uh, Councilor Vasilakos, she said you had something. Yeah, I was just wondering about item number one, which is the endorse the need for one additional staff resource for property resident management services in the 2022 operating budget of the housing division. And I just I would like a little bit more information on that only because I believe that may be one of those where it can be covered by rent revenue possibly, but also that there could be some cost savings in doing so. And so, and I, and I think if I recall, it was a while ago, so my apologies, but I recall this might be one where we're just endorsing the hiring, but that the but that that isn't necessarily going to come out of levy. Is that correct? Kimberly, there to answer that. Yes, uh, through through the chair, uh, this can be uh, revenue generating. 
Uh, it was with the Build of Britannia too that it was put on. Um, and uh, the public housing review officer uh, does, does issue various notices that can be revenue generating. Um, but would the salary of this person come out of levy or would it be something that would come out of like the general housing? It would come out of the it would come out of the general housing budget. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Kimberly. Uh, Kathy, was there something else? I'd like to move um, for more information to come back on that position, please. Oh, okay. Second by Councillor Seven. Um, any questions or concerns, clarifications? See none. I'll call the question. All those in favor. Referring item number one. Opposed, if any. And that's carried. Uh, there's a couple. I sorry, uh, Councilor Ingram. Sorry, thank you. I'm also wondering if we could remove um, item number 14 from the list. That was the request from St. Mary's Healthcare Foundation. Um, and I'd, I'd like further information. I'd like them to consider. Uh, the comments from, I think it was Councillor Vasilakos about looking at amalgamating the healthcare foundations. I think that could be beneficial um, throughout here in Perth Healthcare Alliance. Um, and so I'm wondering if we could remove that from the list and uh, just, just give that information back to them. I, I know they heard it through the presentation, but perhaps we could refer that back to them. So we are asking that no uh, discussion take place as far as the ask goes. We are we are looking at a bigger picture item then. Okay. Correct, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, are you seconding that, Councillor Henderson, or do you have a question? I have a question first. I don't remember us ever doing that before. I always remember Stratford General Hospital coming, not always, but you know what I mean when they, need to, to have our support and the hospice. I just don't remember, has St. Mary's ever came to us before? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I assure you in 30 years it has never happened before. I, I don't remember it. Uh, Councilor Burback. Thank you. Just a comment. Uh, I was actually at Stratford General a few days ago and I noticed that in the x-ray department, uh, the St. Mary's Fund actually did uh, make a big contribution to the Stratford Hospital. So I was a, a bit surprised to see that actually. Uh, so they have done contributions and, and helped the hospital here as well. Thank you. Councilor Basilakos. And I'll, I'll second Councilor Ingram's motion on that because I, I, that's precisely the reason why I actually thought that the foundations do overlap a lot. They do cross fund. They do go to the exact same people asking for money. And um, foundations are notoriously expensive in their management and they could really benefit. Um, there's an amalgamation of the hospitals. There's really no reason why they can't amalgamate their fundraising arms to the benefit of everyone in Huron Perth. So, and I would argue that the same, we should almost, um, and anyway, I'll leave that, and then I have another comment about the, the Stratford General Hospital's um, request. But I'll leave it at that on on the on the motion. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Seven. Thank you. I'm actually going to speak against the motion. I, I think I think this was something that I would have liked to see Council consider as in budget deliberations. I think um, you know, it's quite a small ask relative to to expenses and relative to to what hospitals have asked for municipalities in the past and I think you know it goes a long way I think I think these could be two separate things ideally I think we could deliberate about this in the budget and also request that they amalgamate I think an amalgamation or something like that would probably take a very long time to actually happen and, and I think um, you know they're asking for the money um, I probably before that would ever take place um, so I, I think uh, I'd like to see this as part of the deliberation, so I'll be voting against the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else? Uh, Councilor Vasilakos. 
I was going to also add that my comments with the Stratford General Hospital and this as well have been heard by a number of other elected officials who are also getting similar requests like this and wondering when the province is actually going to fix the disparity that exists in capital and equipment costs. And so I, I realize this is something like we feel like we should step up and fund for our communities, but it's also the province is creating a multi-tier system for municipalities. And so I have to say, I usually don't get a lot of interaction with other elected officials and that statement in the media had quite a bit. So um, I, I do think at some point municipalities will have to, to wrestle with that one as well. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Councilor Beatty. I believe our CAO had uh, her hand up requesting the moment of our time. Well, I, I, I look forward to hearing from her. So go right ahead, Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Councilor Beatty. Um, Councillor Gaffney, just wanted uh, through you for committee to be aware that the acting director has prepared a report on the Stratford General Hospital funding request. And we are planning on bringing that report uh, to the October <coughs> Finance and Labor Relations Subcommittee so that you can have a more fulsome discussion on that. And I just wanted you to be aware of that as you're considering this item tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ingram. Thank you for our CAO, just for clarity, does that include the request from the St. Mary's Healthcare Foundation as well, or is it strictly just for the Stratford General Hospital request? Sorry, you, you've got me on that one. So I will ask um, the acting director if she could refresh my memory, all of our memories on that. Absolutely. Um, this was actually something that had me a little bit stumped at the beginning when I first got here, but um, the, this particular, the Stratford General Hospital Foundation was referred back to the Finance and Labor Relations Subcommittee. The, the St. Mary's request was referred to budget. So, so the report that's going to the committee currently as it stands just included the uh, Stratford General Hospital request, but it, they do, it does make sense to address them together. So if there's uh, like, if we wanted to change that around or if talk about that, I, I'm open to changing the report if it's. <clears throat> Thank you for the explanation. So um, perhaps maybe I'll, I'll remove my motion and I'll refer that back to um, the report that's coming forward for finance and labor relations. Has a separate item. Uh, involved in that same report uh, related to this, the Stratford Hospital. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, they shouldn't be, the dollar amounts should not be co-mingled. They're two separate uh, requests. So, okay. Thank you. So you're removing your motion? I will, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a couple things I was hoping we could review. Uh, item number two, retain and consult to develop a tourism strategy for Stratford. Uh, is that necessary for 2022 as I look to, uh, I guess, Councillor Bunting has, uh, has something to say. Please, Mr. Councillor Bunting. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to ask to speak to that particular item. And I, it's my firm belief that we don't need a, a, consul, a, a consultant in the tourism field, we have, I believe that we've got enough expertise in-house to uh, to look at the strategy for the city in the future. Um, I do believe the pandemic's going to keep on going for a little while longer, and and it will maybe trickle into next year. I would say, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Um, perhaps sometime down the road, they may want to consider that, but. Um, that would be one I would take off the list. And with respect to um, Councillor Clifford's previous one about the bylaw enforcement officer working between the hours of 2 and 6 p uh, a.m., should I say, um, so that'd be a four-hour day. Uh, that would be uh, definitely another one that I would uh, remove from the list. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. I will take one motion at a time so you're making a motion on item number two yes to remove that from the list okay and seconded by councillor henderson or does she have a question 
I'll second it, but I also have a comment. I agree with um, Councillor Bunting. I think like since Zach Gribble took over and he's changed things and opened up the sector to everybody. And I think it's free membership now. And, you know, he's really in, involving all the different businesses that I'm not sure that it's such an issue anymore. I think things of, you know, it sounds like all the businesses are getting emails and working together. So um, I'm not sure that it's such a, a, an issue anymore. Okay, thank you. Council Clifford? Yeah, I was just going to ask, we've, we've, I don't know if we need a consultant, but we talked about sports tourism. Is that still, is someone, is that community services looking at that or is that, is that happening to, I call STA or like what's happening with sports tourism along, we've talked about it. Uh, Mr. St. Louis? Yeah, through the chair, it's my understanding that uh, Tourism Stratford is looking into sports tourism. I, I would I would think that it would be a consultation with this department, but I think the lead is uh, Tourism Stratford. Okay, thank you. Council Bunting? Yeah, I know that that particular item is on the list. Uh, the cycle uh, tourism has already been started and uh, hopefully that will be successful. And look at and, and other types of tourism are being considered at this time. By destination Stratford, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. Carried. Uh, another item I'd like to have a closer look at is item number four the investigation and development of a municipal culture plan for 2022. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Uh, Councilor Burback. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, at, at the time uh, we were discussing, I think it was tourism, but also uh, the coordination of the arts uh, we have a, a huge arts sector here in, in Stratford and there isn't any coordination uh, between any of it, but it does, it does feed into tourism. So mm -hmm. if you have a cultural plan, uh, it can then directly affect the, the visitors, but local tourism as well as tourism further afield. So, uh, but it, it, it's also internal in that a lot of people in, within the city do participate in arts organizations. So it would be also really important for citizens to have some strengthening of the programs and also community services overlaps with that as well, uh, the programs that they have. So I think I always think it's better to have a plan. Um, when I'm looking at these items and I'm seeing like on community services, uh, having a, a, what do we call it, a plan for um, recreational services, I think those are really important to to put into place so that in the future they will revenue uh, generate revenue. So I, I, they, they'll cost us now, but I think in the future there not, will there'll I'm be rewards not, to it. Not speaking in opposition to this plan. I'm speaking to does it need to be done 2022? Right. That's yeah, the, I don't. Well, it's hard to know if if we don't know what the cost is. It's really hard to know. <laughs> You know, as far as budgeting goes, I, I have no idea how much that would be. Like, not not even a ballpark. So I find it really hard to decide some of these things because I can't. It's it's there's nothing to compare. There's no numbers. So I find that a little difficult that we're going to take things off before we know what they are going to cost. I think Councillor Clifford was talking to that earlier as well. Uh, Mr. St. Louis. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, we have done some preliminary work in checking other uh, cities and towns on their cultural plan. And in terms of numbers, it, it, again, it would, it's difficult because some of them are a few years old, but we would estimate around $50,000. Okay, thank you. Councilor Clifford? Uh, when I was at AMO last time or time before, I thought they came up with a great idea. Uh, Ottawa's done this. When they have any, for instance, the hub, we're going to build the hub. What they would do is whatever the budget was, they would take 1% of that and put it towards culture. We had a parking garage. So that's a way you can get, if you plan your project and plan a cultural 
so what they did in Ottawa, they they they'd have sculptures and and they, they actually had um we drove around and we looked at it and it was quite amazing what they did without it, it, and because it was just a certain percentage of these projects, I, I think that is an outstanding idea that Stratford, that, that it could help us in the future. And I think culture for Stratford is extremely important, but what it comes to, we don't have the dollars to pay for it. So you got to plan how you're going to pay for it ahead of time. So I'd like to see that instituted sometime. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bunting? Oh, you, sorry, you had your microphone off, so I assumed you wanted something. Councillor Ritzma? Yeah, just wondering, um, staying in line with uh, what Council Burback just mentioned, going down to item number five, um, maybe the Director of Infrastructure and Development could give us a, an idea of what that 2% might look like for the active transit um, project. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, just one second. So we're moving on from number four. Oh, no, I apologize. I, I and that's fine. I don't have to. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, then yes, uh, item five. Uh, uh, Taylor, if you have some uh, information on that, please. Yeah, so the chair, my apologies. Uh, I did not prepare those numbers for this meeting. Um, still looking into what uh, exactly the annual capital budget being specified is here. Um, I haven't done that background as of yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, just. Uh, bit of clarification. We're not especially want to get our heads wrapped around exactly how much it's going to cost to do these things. It's whether we want to do them in 2022. So, you know, we didn't ask staff, staff to put a price on these things because they're plenty busy enough. Uh, so they're, they're hoping that we can whittle the list down. If we don't whittle the list down, that's fine. They will go ahead and price everything and we will know better in, later in October uh, what it adds to the budget. Uh, and it, I'm sorry, but I need a break. So I wonder if we could take five minutes um, and, I, and I apologize, but it, I gotta have a break. So uh, let's say before 10 after seven, please. Thanks.
Well, we've got quorum back in attendance, so we should move ahead. And uh, again, I apologize to everyone. Sometimes you got to go when you got to go. So uh, uh, back, back, back to our uh, our list. Uh, uh, sorry, I apologize, Councilor Retzma. You brought up item number five. Uh, and I guess Taylor spoke to it. Uh, Councilor Vasilakos. Yeah, I just I wanted to speak to this one, but then I also wanted to speak to the one about the cultural plan, if I may, if we can go back, just because I had my hand up. And yeah, please. It's hard to see us waving. Um, and I think the interesting part about the active transportation one is that some years we've actually hit the target, and some years we haven't, depending on the projects. So while it's referred as um, sort of a 2%, I, I'm thinking what I, I think, I think what we need more is to track um, a little more. And I, we do have a, a report card, that the Active Transportation Advisory Committee is creating. And I'm wondering more, more than saying 2% has to be spent on active transportation. I'm wondering what we actually need to do is have a look at our past budgets and, and budgets over time and report how much we're spending on active transportation. And I'll add that that includes sidewalks, that sidewalk projects, um, bike lanes, multi-use trails. It, it includes, uh, we used, it was in, well, the one year it was included in the pedestrian light crossing at Huntington. So it includes, you know, all, you know, the downtown traffic study that's going to rejig the, that Church Street intersection to make it safer for pedestrians. All those kinds of projects sort of are included but I think what we need more than some kind of a something that dictates two percent because what if one year it's three percent like we don't want to cap it or minimize it but what I'm hoping we can do over time is just that during every budget cycle report what does our active transportation spending look like and if it starts to track you know well below you know two percent or one percent then how do we adjust for that how do we bring that back up into the conversation um I would prefer starting there rather than just throwing a number out of 2% when we may be spending 3% this year. I don't know. Okay. Uh, any other comments on that one? And I don't see a motion on it, so we'll carry on. Uh, Kathy, you wanted to... Well, could, could we? I would just like a motion that we track um, spending on active transportation and that they, it could feed into the Active Transportation Advisory Committee's um, annual report card. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Ritzma is obviously seconding that. Councilor Burbeck, uh, you have a comment or a question? I do, yeah. The, we did have, we were approaching 400. Is that correct for this year? For 400,000 for uh trails and multi-use paths and that that type of thing so that will be still included in the budget regardless of what this information comes back as is that correct um, i don't know maybe the director of infrastructure might know that i think we were increasing it each year and then this last this year was going to be uh four hundred thousand. Uh, Taylor. Uh, to the chair, um, I guess more speaking to Kathy's point that uh, 
it wouldn't be difficult for us to track how much spending we are um, doing each year in terms of capital infrastructure for uh, pedestrian and cycling traffic and where that money goes. So that should not be a uh, difficult to measure. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed to Betty? Carried. Um, and back to item number four, uh, Council Vasilakos. So I, I have some concerns about, we. this is another one of those where we, we tend to punt it because we don't think it's mm -hmm. that important. But one of the issues I have about not having a cultural plan is not only do we not have a plan for how we would, might raise money for, for um, public art, like Councillor Clifford talks about, which other communities do, um, which is really important, but it also doesn't guide our let's say it doesn't guide our deliberations when we talk about what we fund through the community grants program. We have a lot of arts communities and we do it sort of on an ad hoc basis. We give money to different organizations, but we don't have a larger strategy about what that looks like, how we address different, you know, how we address children's arts programming or seniors and things like that. Like we don't have a strategy. We also then, because we don't have a cultural plan, those groups in the community um, often go out and get so I would say through through the pandemic what was a real concern is not having a cultural plan that has all the arts community on the same page. We did end up with a lot of federal and provincial funding being spent on expansion of music venues, for example, which are wonderful. But it was in some ways a repro it was a repro reproducing like and redundancy in the system so that a cultural plan may have helped to create you know, better use of that funding. And so I am really concerned about punting it yet again, because we've talked about it since my first term. And I would be interested in seeing mm -hmm. whether there was an appetite to take, like we have the money for, um, that we spend sort of every year on our community grants. And maybe what we should be doing is looking at some of that money for a one-time um, cultural plan that then we can use in subsequent years to help guide those community grants. We've done a really good job over the last few years of formalizing the community grants and coming up with some criteria and, and, and making it more structured. But I'm wondering whether the logical next step is having something like this. So I don't know that I wanna punt it yet again, to be honest, I would like to actually see if we can find the money to do it. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Bunting. Through the chair, um, when I got uh, involved with uh, Stratford Tourism Alliance, now Destination Stratford, uh, about seven years ago, um, there, there was a huge silo effect within the various uh, components of the, the cultural uh, piece of Stratford, huge. And uh, over the last number of years, those have been broken down considerably uh, by virtue of the fact that like Summer Music was using the uh, gallery and also venues at the museum. And they're also working in collaboration with the Stratford Festival. And I think that's bodes well for future. Um, I do believe we've got enough experts in-house uh, on all the various boards that uh, these organizations have that uh, I think they're starting to play nice in the sandbox as it were, and I do believe that uh, a cultural plan is a good idea, but I'm just not so sure that we, we need it right now. And I get Kathy's uh, uh, take on this, but at the same time, I, I don't know if it's uh, something we wanna get involved in too much uh, this year, or next year, should I say. Thank you. Councillor Burback. Thank you. Um, I would tend to agree with Councillor Vasilakos. I'd like to see this item continue. Um, just comment on what Councillor Bunting said. Uh, it was actually the person who has started a Stratford Arts Council here uh, who approached me and said, we really need this plan. This is the person who works with all the community groups and is, is a leader <laughs> uh, to try to organize. And he said, we need this plan. And it what Councillor Vasilakos said is, is correct that 
funding and other things and, and working together uh, can really provide cost savings for these groups as well. So I would like to see this item go ahead. And I don't know, do I need to make a motion to, to do that or will it just stay on the list? Uh, we would prefer that we reinforce our commitment to these items. So yes, I would ask that a motion be made. I'll make that motion. Moved by Councillor Burback, second by Councillor Vasilakos. Council Clifford. Yeah, I was just gonna comment as Kathy was talking there, it, it, and, 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 and oh, no. as Graham was saying, if you could bring these groups, if council could bring these groups together, sit down and talk about uh, the things we need. I don't know if it's going to cost that much. I think we do have expertise, but if we can't get them all together talking and on the same page. So I, I think I think it is something that it, if we're going to do it, we have to do it eventually. And I, I think if we had this committee, I'm going to call it, there's lots of ideas out there that it, and I don't think it would cost us a lot, quite frankly, but I, it would help the, I think it would help the whole cultural society in Stratford. Councilor Beattie. I think it's safe to say it'd be, we'd be pretty hard pressed to find anybody who'd be opposed to supporting our arts program. We understand how important it is in our community, especially to support our arts. Um, and, and, you know, to Kathy's point, it's not about punting it down the road. It, it's just simply about prioritizing what can we and what can we do. Um, it, it's not that. I, I'm opposed to this. It's just, I just think if there's only so many dollars, it, it's a tough decision that we have to make. And, and I just don't know if this is a year that we can do it. And, and again, it's not that I want to punt it down. There, there's many projects that we consider every year and have to make hard decisions on. Um, and again, it's not that I'm opposed to supporting the arts at all. Um, I don't think any of us are, but it's just a difficult decision that we have to make. And maybe that's one I'll have to make today. Good, thank you. Uh, if there's nothing else, all those in, all those in favor, or did you have something else, Councilor Vasilakos? I I did. I just wanted to point out that one of the hardest hit sectors in Stratford has been our cultural community and 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 that community. And so I know that sometimes we we view um, culture and the arts as a nice to have, but um, having a cultural plant that allows, um, that shows a commitment on the part of the city to actually have a long-term vision for the arts and culture in a community that one of our hardest hit um, sectors in terms of for like, you know, citizens who live here and also work in the sector. I think this would be actually, I think of all the years that we should be considering a wow. plan to support our arts community and development of the arts in our community. This might be the year that that we we do it, and and with all those tough decisions, I think this this might be the year. I, I can't imagine anybody questioning the city of Stratford's commitment to culture. But uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. Carried. Uh, Councillor Ritzma seemed confused on which way he was going to vote there. No, I wasn't confused. I just wasn't sure of the motion. I'm sorry. I didn't get kind of lost in there. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you uh, 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 say the, the motion for us again, please? So, this is the chair. It's my understanding that the motion is that the that staff uh, complete an investigation and development of a municipal cultural plan. Thank you. I, I will I will ask again, all those in favor? Opposed to Benny? Uh, it carries. Um, item number six. Sorry, Councillor Henderson. I had one I wanted to still bring up too was number, and we like find it again, number 12. I think it's important that we move forward on that. Um, as we heard, we need to start fundraising and we need to have that part of when we're applying for the grant. So 
I think it's important that we um, start fundraising. This is going to be our fourth year next year when we got elected. So I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councilor Henderson. Councilor I will second that. Uh, any questions or discussion on this item, uh, Ms. Thompson? Thank you. Um, so just to um, just to give an update, uh, so we are preparing to issue the RFP um, to retain a, uh, a campaign manager for the fundraising campaign. And once we know the amount of that, we will be including that in the budget for 2022 uh, for council um, approval. So that will be coming later this fall still. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions on that? Comments? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to Penny? Carried. Uh, okay. Uh, and I apologize that we should have did this right from the start. Because staff wants direction on each of these items, we should be going through each of these items. So we've dealt with uh, Number four, five, three, uh, item three, Any anybody want to make a motion to move ahead with that project or to delay that project till a future Councilor Vasilakos? This is the uh, curling thing. Um, I, I think that one's just to refer it to the community grants program. So I- Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, still, and, it's, and uh, is it is it even going to go on? Is it still on the agenda? That's what I'm wondering if this one is still relevant. That's a good question, Mr. St. Louis. Yeah, the award has been made to Stratford uh, for the end of March, and the, the plan is that it'll still take place. It may not be with spectators at this time, but uh, we're hoping that it will. But it's still in the works. I'd still like the motion to re re uh, enforce our position on that. Uh, I saw Councillor D and Councillor Clifford first. Uh, any questions, further questions or comments on that? Uh, all those in favor? Opposed to Benny? Carry. Uh, item six, uh, development of green standards policy. Council Burback. Yes, just to clarify, uh, it was actually for green development standards. So this would be standards for um, production of new development and housing. Uh, and I, I think it's really important because this is the one item on this list that actually is uh, uh, environmental, addresses environmental issues. And uh, because we've declared a, a climate emergency, uh, but we haven't actually created a plan yet, this would be something that would probably be incorporated in that plan. So I don't, I don't want to see it disappear, but maybe it's not the right moment for this on the budget. It, it maybe should come through that climate emergency plan, if that makes sense. So um, I definitely want to see this getting done, but um, thinking that maybe we can delay it um, and make sure that it gets into that climate emergency plan. Okay, maybe I will ask uh, Ms. Thompson if that's a possibility or is that, uh, is that uh, oh, 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 right protocols? Or... Um, so I would like to take this back and have a discussion with, um, with staff. I know that there is an update on the um, climate report coming to um, council. I believe it's for the next regular council meeting. Um, so uh, if I understand correctly, there is a consideration of perhaps not the 2022 budget on its own, but having this made part of the climate response plan for the city. And I would like to have that conversation with staff and report back out to council. So how would you like us to deal with it uh, this evening? Um, Mr. Chair, if you could um, request a motion to refer it to staff to consider this as part of the climate response plan report, that would be appreciated. 
Okay, thank you. Council Burback. Yep. Uh, I saw Bonnie's hand next. Councilor Henderson seconding. Any other questions or discussion on that? I will call a question. All those in favor? Opposed to Petty? That's carried. Uh, item seven. Uh, resources to implement and sustain the community safety and well-being plan. Councilor Henderson. I'm moving it. To keep it in the budget or to remove it? No, to keep it in. I I kind of figured that, but you have to say it, Councilor Burbeck. Yeah, I'm, I also agree with that. Uh, it's going to be a shared cost with other municipalities. And I think that uh, a lot of the, the plan is really important to, to start implementing. So I'm going to support that motion. So seconded by Council Burbeck. Uh, uh, Ms. Thompson. Yes, thank you, um, Chair Gaffney. Just wanted to also reiterate that having a community safety and well-being plan is a mandated legislative requirement for municipalities of our size. So this one is a is a given anyways that we were going to be including, and we would be looking for support um, for some funding uh, in the budget each year uh, in order to implement and move along um, addressing uh, the, the gaps in our communities. But we would still appreciate a motion if you would like to give one this evening. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions or comments on that? Council Clifford. Yeah, and, and we may have talked about this earlier, but are there any grants on that? If it's a provincial mandate, have, have they come up to the plate and help with this? <laughs> Ms. Thompson. Yeah, sorry. Um, the answer is we have not been able to identify any, but we continue to um, be hopeful that at some point there might be, but at this point it falls to each municipality to fund uh, their own uh, implementation of the, the plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed to Petty, carried. Uh, Mr. Defoe, if I start repeating one we've already dealt with, you'll stop me, please. Because I think- uh, through, through the chair, yes. And I would just note at this time, there are at least eight items uh, where further action is to be taken. Okay. Have we dealt with that? We dealt with item number eight yet? Yes. Yes. The next item is number so nine, ten, and eleven. Okay. Item number nine. Any uh, councillor Vasilakos? Don't we do this every budget year, anyways? Like I'm wondering how this is a referral. Like we had a rate study, but don't we sort of? Isn't it part of what we deliberate, anyways? Like I'm not. It. it this is another one of those we're going to have to do it anyways. Is it that not correct? Ms. Thompson? Yes, so the, um, the establishment of the, uh, I will say the water, the sanitary um, landfill rates is an annual budgeting process. Um, and there is also uh, a required public meeting. So infrastructure and development services will be bringing a report forward. In this case, there is a, a rate study uh, recently um, dealt with that they will be taking into consideration um, as part of that review. So this one will be coming forward again because it is a um, um, requirement as part of the budget process. Okay, so we don't have to re, uh, re up that one, we'll just carry on. Okay, uh, then, uh, um, Item 10, the development of a municipal partnership program. Any feelings on that? Yay or nay? Councilor Clifford. Uh, I, I, I must forget no, but I can't remember exactly. If I could have someone explain what this is exactly, it would be helpful to me again. Uh, Mr. St. Louis. Uh, this uh, municipal partnership program actually has the uh, potential to generate some revenues uh, in future budgets. 
It's the opportunity to create an inventory of potential assets and marketing the tools. And so that uh, we can market those items to potentially sell advertising or other methods uh, of collecting revenue. Okay, thank you. Council Clifford. We'll move that. Council Clifford moves, second by Council Beatty. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, Councilor Vasilakos. I was going to say that I thought this one could just delay a, a year only because I know that if we're looking for sponsorship, a lot of businesses are still struggling through COVID and there may be not many opportunities. And so like it just this this one was one that I flagged as it is possible to wait a year before we do it. But that's that was just my thoughts on it. Council Clifford. Well, the the I believe the programs have gone out in in the um in the in in the arenas already and it, it all we're going to do is inventory right now so it will take time and i think the economy is going to pick up so i i think you got to plan ahead and for i think now's the time we, we should be planning our inventory and i i think by 2023 when we'll likely be into it uh, there'll be lots of opportunities for sponsorship okay then I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, Betty? That's carried. Uh, item 11 is the request from the uh, SGH Foundation. Uh, so, so, the chair, if I could, um, this is an item that will be discussed at the Finance and Labor Relations Subcommittee meeting that's upcoming. So, perhaps we could. Just pause that item and then move to item 13. Uh, okay, well, yes, but I think everybody has an understanding that this request we're probably not going to deal with next year anyways, because the foundation does understand that we're paying off our commitment to the respite house before we do anything else. So. That'll be part of the discussions, I suppose. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, item 12, uh, the funding for the accessibility renovations to the Stratford Public Library. Councillor Henderson. I'm moving it, but it's item 13. Oh, sorry, what, what did I say? You said 12, but we did that. The grand yes, plan. yes, we did. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Good number 13, though. Yeah. Can I, so you're making a motion to keep that in the budget? Yes, for sure, 100%. Okay. Uh, seconded by Councilor Bunting. Uh, any questions or comments? I think the CEO of the library is here if anybody had any questions. There she is right there. Uh, uh, Councilor Clifford. Yeah, it, 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 am I correct that we already have that in the capital, in the capital facility? Capital facilities, a reserve, it's already in there, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Taylor popped up there, so maybe he has uh, something to say to this. Yes, uh, through the chair, what was uh, committed already was the uh, consulting work of $30,000 in the last council meeting uh, on August 9th. Um, we have deliberations for um, the actual capital works for the scheduled 2022 work, which would include the remaining uh, construction work for this project. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to Penny? That's carried. Um, item 14, 15, and 16. Are we, are we done those or? Uh, through the chair, item 14 has been completed and item 15 and 16, no motion has been made. Okay, uh, so we'll start with item 15. Strategic master plan for recreational services. Moved by Councillor Henderson to retain or? I actually have a question first. Um, I know, I, I think it was Jody that brought this up. 
that the recreation plan had actually expired in say 2018. Is there actually anything in the recreation plan that would have changed drastically that it would need to be done, you know, right away? Or is it helpful that we look at it again? I, you know, I just, <laughs> I don't know how much things would change in a recreation plan. Uh, uh, Mr. St. Louis? Um, through the chair. I mean, since that plan is uh, put, put in place, there's several changes that have been made. And to highlight a couple, one would be the rotary complex, which added two ice services to the inventory, and also the soccer improvements that have taken place. And I'm assuming, you know, without looking back in my memory, there's probably other several items that uh, have changed since that plan has expired. If I could add that, um, if that plan takes place in 2022, that will be three plans in the Department of Community Services, which may be a little bit of an overlap. So would it would community service be put out if we put this off for another year? If that's well, based on the previous motions that have been made tonight, it uh, may be uh, trying for us to uh, accommodate all three plans. So would Councillor Henderson's motion reflect that or not reflect that? I didn't have a motion. I was just asking a question. Okay. Councillor Basilakos. Uh, my question was uh, around the other two motions for the work. Would those actually feed into then the recreation master plan? Like what I'm saying is, is are doing the other two then going to help then in the strategy? Like it doesn't make sense to defer it for a year given the work that the others are going to do. Um, through the chair, I, I think there'll be some small parts of the other uh, plans that will uh, <coughs> the recreation master plan, but the recreation master plan will certainly uh, take part with a lot more detail in terms of sport and recreation. Yeah, and that's where I was thinking of, I know we're going through this um, sort of sequentially, but have we got, I guess my question is, have we got the order right in how we're doing all of these? Like, would it I know we've approved the other two things, but would it make more sense to the recreation master plan first? And would it then help the other two or are they not that connected? I would say through the chair, they are connected, but they would be uh, a little bit of the recreation master plan. And I don't see a problem with doing the first two and then, and then moving the recreation master plan if needed to 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A plan like this, do we have to hire a consultant or is it an in-house project? I'd ask our director of community services. Mr. St. Louis? Be our recommendation to hire a consultant that would lead the project. Again, uh, I mean, our department has uh, people that are already busy and uh, taking on this task, which I think is fairly large in terms of doing looking at our recreation master plans in the past and then moving forward, connecting with others, uh, sport and recreation group, groups, it would be advantage to us to hire consultants to lead the project. Thank you. So I will entertain a motion on uh, direction for this item. Councilor Anderson. I'd like to move this to the 2023 um, budget deliberations. Thank you. Seconder. Councillor Beatty, um, any other questions or comments on this item? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed to any? Carried. Um, item number 16, the uh, one year contract for overnight parking enforcement. Uh, and as I said before, the chief is here if anybody has any questions on this particular item. Uh, so I will start with Councilor Clifford. Yeah, I'd like to ask the chief. I'd like to ask the police chief if it's if it can be possibly done by the police that we have right now. Between two a.m. and six a.m. Yes, through the chair, uh, uh, Councilor, we are currently doing uh, bylaw enforcement for uh, uh, parking two to six. 
Um, most of our enforcement, albeit uh, uh, I, I will uh, agree that it is complaint based. We're not out there doing proactive uh, patrol specifically for parking violations. We are responding to the public and we are responding to uh, snow plows in the winter when they have concerns about parked vehicles. Um, we did a very preliminary search of our complaints and, enforce and enforcement this morning. And we had approximately 323 parking related complaints uh, that the uh, Stratford police responded to in 2021. Those are not specifically two to six uh, uh, complaints. They are parking um, uh, overall. And we lay charges in approximately 25% of those uh, situations. Uh, some we use education and give people an opportunity to move their vehicle. In uh, other situations, the vehicle is gone uh, before the uh, police are able to arrive and uh, take any enforcement action. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, Councillor Vasilakos. So I think it was Councillor Clifford that sort of mentioned sort of like enforcement blitzes, right? Like, it, I think I think the city, I think councillors get a lot of the complaints about overnight parking and people don't realize that, you know, you, you call the police or, or any of those things, but I'm wondering if there's any appetite to do a, very similar to what we did with this around the schools, working with um, maybe perhaps in this case, the plow drivers plus the, 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 you know, the communications lead and doing, doing a, a few weeks sort of at the beginning of plowing season in the middle to sort of tamp down on, on um, the behavior. I think the feeling was with the one year contract position was to, to see if we can consistently enforce the overnight parking bylaw such that it changes people's behavior. And so uh, the, the, the uh, rather, so rather than an ad hoc um, complaint based, maybe something a little more proactive. And if that was possible through collaboration with the police, that would be one thing. But, but if, we, if we didn't have that consistent um, approach to it, then I think the one year contract position might be worth it. Council Clifford. Yeah, I, I, believe, um, I believe education is a big part of it. I bet if you ask the average person in Stratford if they can park, what time they can park and what time they can't park, they wouldn't have any idea. So I think education would be, and I, I agree with uh, Council Basilasco that as far as education, I think, I think it would help a lot. I think if we had a blitz of education, because I don't think people want to break the law, but I mean, they don't know and they don't maybe care sometimes. So education would help. Followed by enforcement, though. That always, ch behavior changes when you do education followed by enforcement. You usually don't get very far on education because they'll backslide. Uh, uh, Councillor Bunting. Yeah, as someone who's written a few of these in my day, uh, I uh, think that the police are certainly adequate to uh, take care of it. Uh, for the most part, uh, when complaints come in, the police definitely respond to it and, and issue a ticket. Uh, with regards to the winter time, and this is where the real problem is. And whenever there's street, uh, cars on the street, the plow has difficulty clearing the street properly, as we all know. And um, I, back again in, in, in previous years, I know that uh, a few uh, tow trucks uh, and uh, removal of the vehicle to allow the plow to plow properly will be every bit as persuasive as a five or $10 ticket or whatever the ticket costs these days. So um, I believe that this particular uh, request should be removed myself. Thank you. Yes, would it, it be more of a matter of uh, getting Mike to write something up and add something to our uh, social pages and uh, maybe something to the town crier with the uh, proper, you know, there's two, two roads you come into this community that have signs Let's say what the parking restrictions, the hours between two and six. 
So of, of the five ways to get in the Stratford, three fifths of the people that come here don't know that our rules are two to six uh, in the morning for no parking. So, and then uh, include the contact information for bylaw enforcement and for police services maybe. But anyways, I saw some hands go up. Councilor Ritzma? Yes, another uh, great resource is Constable Fisher. I know, for example, like prior to school, he goes over public awareness around more kids uh, walking or bis using bicycles, et cetera. And I, and I think accessing somebody like uh, uh, Councilor, uh, Constable Fisher, who goes on the uh, morning radio and talks about this just prior to the winter is very helpful. I, that education piece that <laughs> Councillor Vasilakos and Councillor Clifford are talking about certainly um, can be done through him as well. He does an amazing job. Thank you, Councillor Vasilakos. So I'll reiterate that I don't wanna see this removed unless we actually have a real plan or we give direction to staff to work on something to deal with the issue. And so, and so if somebody moves to remove this, then I'd like to make a motion to refer back to staff to work with um, uh, to, the clerks to work with, you know, um, public works to work with the police department to actually come up with some kind of um, both education and enforcement plan on this issue, at least to, at least until we see some better compliance. Uh, Councilor Bunting. Just a question. Uh, it's what's the person going to do for the other four hours of of his or her shift? There's there's nobody here to defend or. No, that that's a question we should we should all be asking. I mean, uh, do we get people who come in for four hours? Uh, because because it'd be the same people that come and do the daily parking, it would be a contract that says we need one person for four hours every night. And uh, that's how they're, that we leave that up to the owner of the operation to decide how they want to distribute hours. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Henderson, I saw your hand a while ago, but I, I skipped over you mistakenly. So please go ahead. Oh, I don't know what order I was in, that's fine. I just had an idea, we still have two, um bylaw officers that work the day shift. What if we tried, say, for two weeks, putting one of them on the 2 to 6 a.m.? And I know it would forego or make it harder on the other person working the day shift. But, you know, it's sort of a lower, I don't know, the festival's still going on, but still, it's, I'm just thinking it's an idea just to try it and see how much it is, because that means they'll be driving all over the city for four hours. We, uh... Uh, I don't know if we can put the courts department in that position. They've hired the personnel they need to do the job we want. <clears throat> so to dilute that uh, resource, uh, it's, you know, like I say, the company that uh, we hire distributes the personnel based on our needs. And if our needs are two people during the day, then that's what we have. So. I'm not making the decision. We as a group are making the decision. Council Clifford. I would like to put a motion on the floor to take number 16 off. Uh, moved by Council Clifford, seconded by Council Bunting. Uh, any other questions or discussion on that? Then I will call the question. All those in favor? Uh, opposed, uh, so that's carried. Uh, so, uh, Councilor Vasilakos, please. Uh, I, I think we're in committee, so I think I can. I'd like to refer to, back to staff to work on a strategy for um, overnight parking um, to see if we can reduce um, some of the infractions. And I think I mentioned earlier how that could look. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilor Burback seconding that. Yeah, and I had a quick comment as well. Um, in addition to all the things Councilor Vasilakos mentioned, <laughs> I think we could look at additional signage as well. I, I do think that signage on, 
on certain streets would be really helpful. Councilor Henderson. I just want to comment too that most cities when you're driving in like Woodstock, St. Mary's or different ones around here, they all have the same signage as we do. Some of them are different hours. Some of them are, a lot of them are two to six. Some of them are three to five or, you know, whatever time they need. But most cities have that bylaw in there so that they can get out and clean the streets and snow plow it in the middle of the night. So I think doing a blitz and education like um, Councillor Vakalovskis was bringing up, I think is, is important. And, you know, we have the town crier and, but I mean, uh, and like, you know, we heard the police chief say like they had over 300 calls and 25% of them got tickets, mostly educational. I drive down certain streets at night, coming home late or whatever. I mean, I haven't done that for a while, but when I was, there's always certain streets that always have 10 or 12 cars. And I think, boy, we can make big bucks on this street. But, you know, it's just, it's just their habit. They're used, used to doing it. They're always there. And I'm assuming it's fine with the neighborhood because it's on both sides of the road. Now we have had people, you know, get a hold of us as counselors, sure, and say, you know, I'm having problems getting out of my driveway. I'm having this and that. We've had people come to council and, you know, we've actually changed where the parking restrictions were on certain street. I'm thinking, I remember we're doing that on, I think it was Hibernia or Caledonia, one of them, and one of the recent ones that I remember. So I think there's ways that we can, you know, address this and and uh, and and I agree that it should be a low priority for the the police to be going around giving out tickets. That's what I've told people. I mean, some people get upset with that, but I mean, they have a lot more important things than keeping us safe in our community. Maybe on a slow night or something, they can do something like that. And hopefully, we have lots of snow lights, but we don't. So anyway, just just a couple of things I'm thinking of. Thank you. Council Clifford. Yeah, I was just going to ask what Graham brought up uh, about towing. Who, who authorized uh, like a car to be towed? Is that the police or is that a bylaw officer or is it just, I, I, I'd like to, and I, I agree. I think if, if my car was towed, I'd never leave it out again, I'll tell you, because my wife would kill me. But, uh, otherwise, like how does that happen as far as towing? Through the chair, I can provide some uh, uh, background on that. So when, uh, when a complaint is received, an officer will go out and they will uh, run a computer check on the vehicle plate. And if the vehicle comes back registered to a residence in the neighborhood, they will do a door knock uh, to try to get the person, the owner of the vehicle, to move the vehicle. If the vehicle's plate does not come uh, back registered to anybody in the neighborhood and it's blocking snow plowing, for instance, then they have the right to remove the car by tow and they will uh, call a tow truck. Uh, by law enforcement generally will call us. Uh, they won't uh, tow a vehicle because um, you don't want to risk a, a, a vehicle getting reported stolen. Uh, and commencing an investigation if there's a breakdown in communication. So generally speaking, it will be the police that authorize the tow, but we make every effort possible to locate the owner of the vehicle to get it removed voluntarily and use that opportunity to educate uh, as well. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, any other questions or comments? And I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed to Penny, that's carried. Okay. That's the end of that list. Um, I'm gonna ask Ms. Thompson if there's anything, uh, any specific question <coughs> you'd like to ask moving forward at the end of this session here. Um, thank you, Councillor Gaffney. Um, so we do appreciate the discussion that uh, we have uh, heard this evening. This has been helpful to CLT as we're finalizing the budgets. Um, 
we will take this back and and use this for direction in including um, a lot of these items now in the budget. Uh, this will make it challenging to achieve uh, two to three uh, percent with again with respect to the new projects. Uh, but we will uh, do our best and uh, come back with the uh, with the budgets. Um, there will still be some uh, discussion and um, direction and tough decisions that will need to be made. Um, but we would appreciate again if there are any uh, additional projects, the sooner they get referred by motion of council to staff, the sooner we can can deal with this. Um, but I would like to contain the number of new asks for uh, further reports, new items, new initiatives for the 2022 budget um, so that we have uh, sufficient time to do a proper assessment, uh, obtain the costs. I will say it is, um, it is difficult to sometimes obtain um, costing for some of these projects. We are experiencing delays in getting responses back, uh, especially from the consultants on possible fees. Um, so we are we are impacted significantly by that. So, but anyways, if there's anything further um, that you would like to give us direction on, or um, just seeking further clarification, we would appreciate hearing tonight uh, by vote of council. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see anything. Any anybody jumping up? I'm going to ask a question. If and it doesn't particularly need an answer, but it may require some contemplation moving forward. Based on the information we received tonight through presentations and through question and answer, are we still comfortable at two or three percent? Or should we be revisiting that? And again, maybe not especially right this minute because uh, it is something that needs needs some deep uh, uh, contemplation, I, I think. So unless anybody has a comment on that, I will move on to the next. Uh, Council Clifford. Yeah, the, the comment I have, obviously, um, we all understand what the inflation level is. The, the other thing we got to consider, we have our own problems, but we have the people in our community that have been underemployed and unemployed all, all, all through COVID. So it's not only our, our, our things we have to look at and our expenses, we have to, like the average person in Stratford, like the wages haven't gone up dramatically. If they have, I don't know about it. So I, I think we, you know, I don't think we have an answer tonight, but anything over 3%, I would feel extremely uncomfortable with and a lot of things we talked about tonight is going to be referred back to staff i know counselors haven't asked that question specifically about having a costing so a lot of this stuff we haven't really decided because we don't know what the cost will be so until we get the cost but personally i would hate to see the increase go over three percent myself I, I think i think we have to all work hard and, and the other thing we haven't talked about and i know um I think Kathy brought up about the blue box. Obviously, if we have to have some user fee costs to help offset this, we hate to do that. But obviously, we have to talk about that. If there are some user fees that we can institute, I mean, I think we have to we have to consider that also. Yes, and we're kind of hoping we have an answer from the Ontario government before long on how blue box materials are going to get handled moving forward. It may be taken out of our hands completely, knock on wood. Uh, okay, thank you, Councillor Clifford. Uh, if there's nothing else, I'd just like to thank staff for uh, the wonderful job they've been doing for us. And uh, the wonderful job I know you're going to do moving forward. Uh, and that being said, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Vasilakos, seconded by Councillor Burback. All those in favor? Carried. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>